What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of Headphones Neil Reviews. I'm your host as always, Headphones Neil, bringing you my latest uh, hodgepodge of reviews that's actually going to be mostly Star Wars related this week because of Star Wars, Revel uh, Star Wars celebrations and then of course my usual update for this week for Star Wars Battlefront 2 and the latest episode of The Mandalorian. So to start it off, I'm going to get a couple of reviews out of the way just more as recommendations rather than actual reviews because they've one of them has actually been out for a little while in the form of the movie The Martian. So this is actually the extended edition and it's a movie starring Matt Damon. So I'm re mostly recommending it because it's one of those films that I find that I'm enjoying as a rewatch once a year. Um, just because it has good story, good emotion, you see that progress and emotional state of Matt Damon as um, an astronaut who's left behind on Mars and has to survive, reconnect with NASA, make, or help them find a way for him to get home. Um, the team building that goes on within NASA with his crewmates and all of that. And the personal struggle with being the only person on a planet and then having to figure out how he's going to live long enough for NASA to actually send a mission to him to rescue him, how he's going to reconnect with them and all of that. So um, in addition to the beautiful visuals that the film has, you have that great acting. You see that emotional struggle of when, like the ups of when um, Matt Damon figures stuff out and he gets he's really excited. But then also the downs of when things go wrong, like when the habitat falls apart when he finds out that NASA hasn't told his crewmates that he's still alive um, and things like that. So you have all those various emotional states. Um, I want to say Donald Glover was probably the most random um, casting in the film because when we get to when you get to that part, I didn't expect to have see him there for some weird reason. But his action, his acting fit in well with all of it. I liked his scene when he's explaining um, everything during the Council of Elrond. So if you have not seen the movie yet, I definitely recommend it. Um, either version is fine, whether it's the original theatrical version or the extended edition. But the extended edition does give you that much more time with panoramic shots, uh, development or character development, and things like that. So it does work in the movie's favor to watch the extended edition. But endless, at the same time, does not take away from the film by not having seen those episodes. Um, so with that being said, the other quick review I wanted to get out of the way is the Linkin Park album Meteora. So this year marks the 20th year anniversary of the album. So they re-released the album with a lot of uh, live performances, demo tracks, a couple of new songs and all of that, all of which make up several hours worth of content. Um, looking at the file names of the um, tracks, it looks like it's like five or six discs long. So if you enjoy the album, if you're a fan of Linkin Park, then I definitely recommend buying the album. Um, it, before buying it myself, I actually went back to see if I owned it. And it, as it turns out, I don't actually, or I didn't actually own the original album. I have Hybrid Theory, um, Vicera, I think, what, their remix album. But I didn't have um, Meteora. So I ended up buying the 20th year anniversary edition. And I will say that it is worth um, the purchase because you get all those live, or it's worth it for the live tracks and the demo tracks just because you hear, you know, the variations of the songs you know, um, but just in a slightly different format. So for me as a Linkin Park fan, it's a definite um, album to own and buy. Even if you have the original, get this version too so you can get all those live recordings if you don't have own them already. Um, so with that, we're going to jump into all of our Star Wars content for this episode. So to start it off with The Mandalorian, um, I originally was preparing a review for it, thinking that the latest episode was the season finale. But in looking online and then going to IMDb, as it turns out, this was actually the penultimate episode. Because in my review, I was thinking that this did not feel like a season finale. It felt like a mid-season cliffhanger, a penultimate em episode, but anything else besides a season finale. Because granted, yes, you have 
um, the death of Paz Vizla. You have the return of Moff Gideon with his Beskar armor. Very reminiscent of a Darth Vader suit. The Imperial Stormtroopers now have Beskar um, armor. And then you have um, the Mandalorian starting to or navigate the planet to... Or trying to navigate Mandalore to try and retake it. But... All in all, it didn't feel like it was a season finale because, you know, we've seen Moff Gideon before. We already know that the Mandalorians are trying to take over the planet and all of that, so, or retake their home planet. But um, in general, this episode worked well to um, bring the Mandalorians together. Essentially, um, the last episode was to get the fleet back so they have an actual force. But this episode brought everyone together because you have, you know, for example, Paz Vizla and the other guy um, playing chess and getting into their fight. You have Grogu in the IG-11 IG suit. Was just saying yes and no, which him, the interactions between him and Din were funny, but um, Grogu telling Paz Vizla and the other guy no to stop fighting. But then also they're coming together over um, the Death Watch, or learning about Death Watch falling apart um, and falling into factions, um, some of the Mandalorians being there and others not being there. So um, with that, and then like Din and Bo-Katan coming together about how he follows her, not because of her royal lineage, but because um, of her honor, trustworthiness, and she's out there with the truth. She doesn't act like royalty. She acts like a true Mandalorian. So um, basically they're coming together. Was, this was all basically to unify all the, the different Mandalorians and what, try to resolve some of those differences between everybody so that everybody um, can actually be on the same side. And I think it was Din who said something along the lines of Mandalorians are strongest when they're together. Um, might have been Bo-Katan, but somewhere in the episode someone said that they're strongest when they're together, they always come back, so if they're divided, they will always um, be defeated. So I'm looking forward to the season finale next week um, to see what happens, how they deal with this fight with um, with a Moff Gideon. And then, of course, you have the secret council where they have the name drop of Grand Admiral Thrawn. So I'm curious to see if um, Jen, I, I want to say Captain Paleon, which is a Star Wars Legends character now brought to life. So I particularly love that part of the episode to um, see him um, interacting with everyone and Moff Gideon essentially, essentially calling him out that Every, that he keeps name dropping Thrawn, but where has he been all his time? If he's around, then where is he to help reclaim the Empire? Um, you have um, General Hux's father um, in the episode on the Council talking about how Gideon wants all these resources, and Gideon saying that they have these. They're they keep um, stealing from the, all these hyperspace lanes, but they're not sharing their wealth and resources and the dark troopers and all of that. So essentially, so. Um, we have that coming together, so it was nice to see General Hux's dad here. But before, more importantly, Captain Paleon, who I think was an admiral in um, the Thrawn books, but I'm not. I mean, he might have been a captain. I don't remember now offhand. But it's good to see that connection. So I'm curious to see if the next episode, the actual season finale, will have the return of Thrawn to see that because maybe he wants to see how. Um, Moff Gideon does in battle. He wants to see which of the remaining um, Imperial warlords he can trust or rely on, which ones are better than others. And he maybe one he just wants to see who the victorious ones are or who can come out in victory in this battle or just wants the battle for analysis before he comes back or something like that before he does actually come back. So with that being said, I'm going to jump into some of the top stories of um, the announcement made the announcements made at Star Wars Celebration 2023. This is by no means going to be an all-inclusive list because there was a lot um, announced, but uh, these are some of the things that I thought of were of particular note. So to start it off, of course, uh, we had the Ahsoka trailer. So the show is coming to Disney Plus in August of 2023. Um, in the trailer, we get a live-action Sabine Wren, Chopper, Hera... Uh, we get a hollow vid of what looks like Ezra, and then of course we get a rear view shot of Grand Admiral Thrawn. So it looks like we are going to have him in the Ahsoka show. So 
having him appear in the Mandalorian season finale will be an interesting connection to see how they tie it all together and how they give us that bridge between the events of what or when the events of the Mandalorian are taking place versus the events of things like Star Wars Rebels. Um, and, and then, of course, after that, we got a couple of trailers for Star Wars Jedi Survivor, which is coming April 28th, the video game. So once I'm done with the additional levels on Battlefront 2, which I'll get to in a little bit, I was thinking that if it's available on Xbox Game Pass, game Pass that I would give the game a shot. But the game looks pretty interesting. We get more lightsaber, or lightsaber options, it looks like, more uh, force powers, and more... Um, details on kind of what the Jedi have been up to, or at least what um, Cal Kestis has been up to. Um, coming May 4th of this year, we have Volumes Season 2, or Volume Visions Volume 2, which is that kind of alternate take of Star Wars, so Star Wars stories set in an uh, anime universe, a uh, feudal Japan style universe, and sort of stuff like that, so... Um, look out for that. Uh, we also have Tales of the Jedi Season 2 coming soon. I didn't notice the date, so I'm assuming it's going to be maybe later this year or sometime in 2024. Uh, we're also going to get the Acolyte, which I think, um, if you went to Star Wars Celebration, then you got to see the trailer, but I'm not 100% sure on that, but I think that's also coming 2024. And then it was announced that Andor is going to get a Season 2 as well, so... Um, hopefully we get a little bit more progression there as far as bridging the gap between Season 1 and the film. And then finally, The Bad Batch Season 3 is set to release in 2024 as the final season. So if I was to give a speculation as of right now, I figure it's going to be related to the, um, the Bad Batch rescuing um, the sniper dude and then maybe finding out about some of the Empire's uh, various projects, probably more most specifically related to cloning, but alternatively, probably things like maybe Operation um, Cinder or the Death Star or things like that. So lots of stuff coming between this year and next year, and then of course you have announcements like um, Daisy Ridley is coming back as Rey and potentially more films with her and Finn. Um, there's um, uh, supposedly a new trilogy of films coming. Not necessarily with Ryan Johnson, but maybe with him. I wasn't quite sure. So, lots of Star Wars content coming over the next couple of years, so look out for all of that. So, to round it out for this particular episode, I had a chance to finish the um, main campaign for, the, for Battlefront 2. This is a single-player option. So, overall, it was actually a very, very good story of... Iden, Versio, and Inferno Squad being a part of the Empire, being one of their elite units of commandos, or their special units forces, and how she got betrayed by the Empire, and notably her father, for not following Operation Cinder, for destroying her home, own homeworld, and following her father, who's the Admiral, ultimately uh, joining the Rebellion, and... Um, performing tasks for them to help them out using her knowledge of the Empire and experience to do what she can to help them out. So overall, it was a really good, fun gameplay. I like the mix of cutscenes to tell the story, um, gameplay and interactions between her and the characters and all of that. It was very, very seamless. I liked all the beautiful locations. So you have places like Jakku, which you fight in the Battle of Jakku, which I assume is what gave us um, the at at for Ray's home, and then the Star Destroyers off in the distance and all of that. So I'm hoping that's the connection, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, and then you have places like uh, Pilio, and then random interactions with like Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, Lando, Han, all of that. The only thing that was kind of weird is why during the game when the, the characters come in, is why you're interacting at, or playing as those characters versus just interacting with them. So personally, I would have preferred to have done the entire game from Aiden's point of view that, you know, she's performing this task and then she meets up with them at some point, like Lou Skywalker on that um, hidden Imperial Crystal place, uh, Leia on Naboo, which was also very well done, uh, Han on that random planet. Same thing with Lando that... Because you're going with uh, Del Mico, you could play as him instead of Lando. 
but have Lando do things for you instead that you would normally do, but have him do it instead. So that was kind of weird, but not to say it was bad to interact with those um, characters and from the movies, but it was good to have all those connections to expand out things like Operation Cinder, see it in action, um, seeing the end of the Battle of Endor, um, and the, re the rea Inferno Squad's reaction to the death of the Emperor, and what the Emperor's plans were in the event of his death before the Empire's goals could be fulfilled. So all in all a very good game. The other thing that was kind of weird was the post Battle of Jakku episode. So once you finish the game you get a cutscene that says decades later and as it turns out um, Agent ha or I think Agent Hask is still alive because you supposedly killed him during the Battle of Jakku but he's still alive. He's been helping Kylo Ren in the First Order um, track down Luke Skywalker. And as it turns out, he finds out that Del Miko and Aiden Versio found that map and took it to Lor Santeca, which leads us directly into The Force Awakens. So now Kylo Ren is on their trail and Agent has turns, turns over Del Miko to Kylo Ren. He finds out about everything that's going on. So he goes out to find what we presume is Aiden. Aiden. Um, so the game it does have an additional three, I think three missions um, after for the events to, to kind of clear up anything that happens and find out what um, Aiden, Aiden's been up to since the Battle of Jakku and their life after the end of the war. Now that the war is over, the Empire is supposedly fallen and all of that stuff. So as a bit of uh, housekeeping, I am going to play those additional levels. And they, because it's only three, it feels like it could be done easily before the release of um, um, Star Wars Jedi Survivor. So the plan is to play those episodes and kind of do a follow-up review, hopefully on the next episode, of how that fo those follow-up episodes impact the main story to find out um, something along the lines to see if, uh, you know, if Aiden is able to hand off the, the map to Lor Santeca, what she does, uh, maybe learn some more information about um, her role in helping the Rebellion and um, taking down the First Order. So that is actually all for this particular episode. So if you have any questions, comments, feedback, or anything like that, links to the social media sites I'm on can be found on the website at headphonesneal.reviews, along with subscription links, supporting the show, and all of that good stuff. Um, a bit of related um, updates as well. If you support the show on Patreon, then you can get an ad-free episode or ad-free version of the episode in your podcast client of choice. So I did post the episodes from March 16th, the first video I started doing a podcast for going forward so those are already available on the feed and um, so you can subscribe support the show that way as well to get ad free version of the show and then if you're on um, either Mastodon or Pixelfed uh, with Mastodon being the Twitter alternative and Pixelfed being the Instagram alternative you can now subscribe to my posts in your RSS feeds of choice so if you are someone who uses RSS readers or prefers to use them um, and I assume I think like Outlook still has that RSS functionality somewhere maybe which I am going to check again just to be sure but if, you ha or if you're on a version of Outlook or an email client that supports subscribing to RSS then you can now get my updates via RSS on Mastodon and Pixelfed which essentially are the same as the posts I put on Instagram and uh, Twitter but uh, this makes it easy to subscribe in your pod and your feed reader of choice so um, you don't necessarily have to go to uh, those specific sites to get my content. So I thought I would share that information but those are all available uh, regardless of how you want to get to whatever social media I'm on. All of the links are on the website at headphonesneal.reviews. But that is all for this particular episode. Thanks for tuning in and until next time.